Hello oh, and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in a new monthly webinar series, AI Analytics and Automation with Nick White. Today, Nick will discuss training a pre-trained model. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To open the chat or the Q&A panels, you will find the icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. As always, we will send a follow-up email within a couple of business days containing links to the slides and recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And now let me introduce to you the speaker of this new monthly series, Nick White. Nick is a seasoned professional with over two decades of experience. He's dedicated to driving impactful business outcomes through the strategic application of data analytics and AI. His extensive experience spans diverse industries, showcasing a passion for leveraging data's transformative potential to fuel innovation, optimize decision-making, and streamline operations. Nick is recognized for his adeptness in assisting organizations across various industry verticals, consistently achieving positive business results through data-driven strategies. And with that, let me give the floor to Nick to begin his presentation. Hello. Hey, Mark. Hey, everybody. Thanks for the nice intro there. Um, Mark, can you confirm you can see my screen? Sure can. All right, cool. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, if it's your first time uh, in this webinar or in one of my presentations with Dataversity, just know I look at the chat. I got two big screens, so feel free to say hi to each other, pepper questions in the webinar chat. Of course, use the Q&A um, if you would like to, and then we'll try to get to those. But in general, I'm really excited to have you here and talk about training a pre-trained model. Um, so let's get started, because there's a lot of content, and I hope to see a lot of um, chatter, even if it's with each other. Um, so objectives for this session, number one, you know, and I wrote these as user stories because you just can't get that out of me. As a business user, you can describe what you need and write good prompts. I want everybody here, if you are here and you're not a programmer, I don't really care. You need to know how to write prompts. Your kids are going to need to know how to write prompts. As a data professional, which I know we have a lot here, and definitely where I come from, my origin story, is as a data professional, um, you want to understand how to use pre-trained models and how it differs from traditional data science projects, okay? These are not the same things. I'm gonna to try to tell you why. And then finally, if we have some engineer friends, whether that is you know, front end, full stack, DevOps, cloud, somebody other than someone you know, doing Python code and analysis, right? I want you to understand you know, what it looks like to have good integrations, picking the right services, making them work, and also, and more critically, working with your designer friends to create a user interface that works for this type of technology. So before we get started, let me just give you my definitions um, of what this is all about. Number one, pre-trained models. Models train on extensive data sets for general tasks. Okay, so GPT-4, Gemini, Llama, you can, I don't care if they're large or small, Anything that we're kind of taking off the shelf and trying to do something with, that's what I'm talking about. I think it's easier than saying large language models because then I start to exclude computer vision and audio and all sorts of other stuff. So I just want to call them pre-trained models. This is the new way of working with data science and AI applications. Number two, user prompting. Like literally, th these are the actions that users take and it doesn't just have to be talking to a chatbot, right? Everything we do with a computer is a prompt when we're trying to get something out of it. It's just really, really important. Now we can kind of just write it in our natural language. But, you know, this has everything to do with how we're asking for what we need. So just think about, we've all been Googling things. And if you're as old as me, Lycosing things, whatever. We've all been asking Jeeves things for a long time. It's a version of a prompt but it's becoming more and more important to ask more things better than to actually know things more. So this is gonna be a big deal. 
prompt tuning. So before you go in and you stand up an AI application, you must be able to kind of tell that right initial prompt. And this is where uh, data professionals as well as um, engineers can get involved. But cr crafting you know, the initial prompt that kind of tells the pre-trained model what to do. This usually happens in some sort of, you know, it's it's not happening in the user UI, but it's happening either in when you're configuring a service or you're, you know, writing a notebook that kind of inserts some, some prompt tuning. RAG, we've all heard it, retrieval augmented generation um, and the data preparation that goes around with it. So, this is still very much, and I will say it over and over again, the quality, the um, applicability of the data that you use is important. Most of the time, if you prompt to in a pre-trained model and you provide it with good data in a RAG structure, in a RAG architecture, you are, and your users know how to prompt, you're gonna be taking advantage of this technology. If you kinda, you know, um, avoid some of this stuff or try to shortcut, it's not going to work. And finally, fine tuning. You know, this is generally what people think of when they think of training. But what I would tell you is it's just one way. Now that we have all these large language models and the ability to prompt tune and architectures that help us do this quicker and services from cloud providers that make it less of a lift to start using some large models, Fine tuning is not as important unless it's needed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in general, when I talk about training pre trained models, it's all of this. It is not just fine tuning. And I want to make sure that everybody's kind of on board with that. How am I go through it? It's the three P's. We're already, we already know there's technology, we already know there's data, but let's focus today on the people, the process, and the pitfalls that go around pre training. Uh, or training a pre-trained model. And finally, I'm going to quote myself because I've said this a few times, but, you know, if you know this image, you know, it's young Sheldon, a genius, but we have to train. <laughs> the The whole point of this is that using a pre-trained AI model is like a genius six-year-old. You have to tell them how to think, you know, as specific as possible and provide them with the good information. Then they can do some cool stuff. If you don't do that, you're basically just letting loose a genius six-year-old on whatever you're telling it to do. So keep that in mind. That is really where we're at. And that is the job ahead of us when we try to train these pre-trained models. All right, so let's get into the people. These are the key roles for success. Now, what I would say is that um, roles do not equate, are not one-to-one -to, -one to like position or one individual. You know, these are just capabilities and responsibilities that are needed for achieving your objectives with this. You know, and I, I can't, I've said it before in other, you know, talks, but in general, AI and the proliferation of natural language processing and all of this other stuff will continue to blur the lines of who does what. So when we look at business users, we'll, we'll talk about it through a set of capabilities, right? We'll talk about data and analytics folks and professionals there. And then we'll talk about design and engineering. Um, but just know that with AI, and even today, as I sit here, I can't tell you who should prompt to. I mean, many people can prompt to if they know how to do it. So I just say this, and this is just my warning in this section. This isn't a one-to-one -one people thing. This is just, you need these roles. You need these things done in order to be successful. All right, so let's talk about business user responsibilities. Two main headlines. One, got to be able to define the use cases, right? It's always been true, but even more so, I see people kind of shooting with a shotgun instead of, you know, what I would say is a sniper rifle, which is, you know, you have to have a reason why we should be looking at using a pre-trained model to you know, solve some things. So being very specific and knowing, hey, here are the pain points, here are the opportunities. I understand enough about how different pre-trained models work and how AI can help, how automation can help, 
that I can kind of help opportunity, like spot opportunities to use it and also kind of bring up pain points. Defining user requirements, very, very important. Like user stories, what, who needs what to do what so that they can do what next? We have to know that. And guess what? It's no surprise to anybody here if you've heard me talk, but taking an agile approach, having feature prioritization, not everything all at once, but what's step one, what's the next step? Understanding how, you know, building something as complicated as this is going to take prioritizing features and making sure that you're taking an iterative path. And then the third part, things that aren't captured in databases or the internet or whatever else a AI model might learn from, your domain, domain expertise. Now this could be helping understand, okay, what does this data mean? You know, so now we're back to data governance, right? Knowing what the data means and what it's useful for and when it's good or bad. And then also knowing, hey, what are the things that we should measure from a KPI perspective to make us successful? How do we measure that, right? And then second, creating effective prompts. So one, if you're not doing the prompt tuning, you're gonna need to tell that, tell that um, either engineer, you know, developer, or data scientist, hey, this is this is what needs to happen. This is exactly, you know, these are the objectives. This is how it needs to think. Here's some context. So think about teaching that six-year-old, hey, first do this, then do this, then do that. Very important, huge role for the business users and users. You know, then when you get your hands on it, you need to be able to craft clear and specific prompts. So depending on what type of application you end up using, you need to be able to write with clarity and precision and give specific instructions. So if you think about, I need to prompt tune this thing to general do a lot of things. And then from there, I need to be able to craft and help others know how to craft the best prompts to get what they need out of it after it's been prompt tuned. And then the last one, iterate and refine. So you're gonna to have to get do a lot of testing. You have to provide a lot of feedback and you will always be thinking of, you know, how do you improve this? So by doing that and taking this mindset, you know, really understanding how you can make this work. So testing and feedback, it's not over, it's not build it and they will come. There is a big responsibility here, even more so, because we're trying to get to a place where we're telling a computer how to think and what to think on. And the best way to do that is to have the humans that generally have to do all the busy work to help teach it how to do that and how to think. That doesn't go away. This is where we're talking about, this is supposed to augment humans, not replace humans. And this is how you get to that place. So I'll just stop there. I don't, Mark, I don't see any chatter. I don't see any questions. I don't know if people are just shy, but, you know, do, does anybody, can anybody here kind of give me a little bit of a, you know, any thoughts around this? Any any ideas about prompting? Just so I know that everybody's awake and that I'm connected. All right. Yeah, a lot of, lot of different examples of doing a, a use case. Thank you for making me feel like I'm not talking into an, a vacuum. It can be very lonely here. Uh, Christy Black, you know, another color last name, love it. Um, yes, this is all about augmenting. Cool. Feel free to, you know, put stuff in there and I will definitely talk about use cases. So. Before I move on, because Chris, you've asked, and I just made sure I kind of, <laughs> I feel like I'm doing a stand-up routine and I just started doing crowd work. But so Chris, you've asked, use case. Everybody wants to use this for customer service, right? How do I get a chat bot? Well, let's think about that. Like what are, so let's, let's run it through. Um, 
And I have a few examples of these that I believe I've given before. But what I would say is the point of a customer service chatbot is a couple fold. One, at the top of it is that I want to increase my customer satisfaction, right? That should be number one. Is And by doing that, if I start to split that up, and I might at a later date have to talk through you know, how you can craft a KPI tree that helps you get to points that make a lot of sense. But, you know, one of the examples I had, and I think this will be, um, and yes, Hagen, yeah, you can vector. Um, you usually want to use a vector DB when you're doing RAG. You know, there are some use cases for semantic searches. There's actually a lot of use cases around um, within a lot of these, you start to combine traditional search with natural language processing. It it really is a thing. Back to the use case. Um, everybody here has or needs or would love to have uh, good health insurance, right? Now, for in America, and I know we have an international um, following here, but in America, you usually, you buy your insurance, you get it provided to you from an employee. Those manuals and those policies, and you can uh, let me know if you've experienced that, it's it's not the easiest read, right? So the first use case that we looked at was, in general, it cost a um, provider like Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is pretty large out in Portland, we have Kaiser. It costs an insurance company $18 per phone call that they have to um, take. Now, you know all of that gets pushed back to us, right? So the use case there is that if I can understand what most people are calling the helpline with, then I can try to eliminate it with a customer chatbot. What we found in this particular use case is that most of those calls were just asking, what's my deductible? Or things that were easily found. So in that case, for that use case, it was all about one, we had to understand how we could save money for the company and, and also the patients, right? So we, we really locked onto that. If we can reduce $18 and we can get rid of all these easy to answer questions, that are just hard to answer because policy documentation for health coverage is like worse than the US constitution or anything like that, right? So by doing that, we were able to zone in on things where we could create a chat bot, but then we had to vectorize um, the PDFs because they were so large. So when I talk about defining use cases, it's like understanding, hey, you know, based on using a natural language processor and especially a, a fine a model that's been pre-trained on understanding, you know, medical jargon and things like that, identifying what that is, identifying what the KPI OKR is, and then solving it one use case at a time. So just starting with simple things like, hey, this chatbot can answer how much deductible for X, Y, Z in network, out of network. Once we get it doing that, then we can start having it do more and more sophisticated stuff. So that is the big use case that I saw that um, in my time that should impact all of us that we've all kind of um, been exposed to at least. And Darcy, yeah, everybody's hurting cats. I mean, look, uh, here's here's what I'll say, and I'll get more into it. You're not alone. Um, I was just joking with Mark as we set up for this that, you know, we are going to see a lot of people go from, you know, the peak of inflated expectations to the trough of despair if they don't start thinking differently. And this is kind of this is why I'm doing this. Like, honestly, I don't want to see us miss out on AI again. All right. So I'm going to move forward. Keep them coming though. Thank you. I had to, I had to bother you because I kind of felt alone and I'm an only child, so I don't like to feel lonely anyway. 
All right, the good, the bad with the prompting. Here we go. Um, so I won't milk this, but at the end of the day, you know, there are good ways to prompt and there are bad ways to prompt. And if you guys have used this, you understand that, you know, explain why a customer's order is late kind of stinks. So if I'm asking this thing to write an email um, to respond, or even I'm trying to automate it, you know, imagine, you know, explain why a customer's order is late. Your order is late due to unforeseen circumstances. Not helpful, right? So it's vague. It lacks context. Context. It's missing information. Whereas if I write a prompt, and this could be when I'm prompt tuning or, you know, while I'm writing a prompt and those lines blur, respond to a customer asking, you know, why order blah, blah, blah is placed on blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing my blah, blah, blah. So it's better than yada, yada. Has not been delivered yet. Provide an update on the current status and expected delivery date. So you can see way better result. It's clear. It's specific. It's giving some context and it's actually given action, actionable information. So all I'm gonna say is anybody who expects the left to give you anything the first time, it, it's not gonna work. So you would never wanna automate that. So when you get into good prompting, one, you do it once, and two, you're able to actually start to probably use this to automate things, um, which is very cool. So just an example, again, you get all of this, um, but there is a lot to go through. So data and analytics responsibilities. Now there is data preparation and it could be for, I'm gonna say for RAG first and then tuning, right? And then tuning, and we're gonna call it prompt and fine, right? So data preparation, right? Make sure you have, do you have relevant data sources? Is it, is it a big enough collection? Is it relevant to the actual thing or is it too general, right? Make sure you have the right ones. We all know about this, clean and pre-process it, data cleaning, pre-processing, pre structuring data. So here's where you start to get into, you know, all right, what's the format? Are we using, you know, Parquet CSV? Are we, what are we, what are we doing here? Um, and then, you know, you may select, we're gonna use a vector DB. Great, do it. Um, for RAG, you want to make sure that you have context passages and your lab labeling data points and you're doing all of that. It, it just won't work. And that's why, you know, the vector database has become has come back with with a revenge, right? And then, you know, a lot of us are probably aware of all of kind of the training and validation um, setup that you have to do to do model training. Now, I'm gonna say this again, but focus on the rag first and focus on the prompt tuning first and then try to figure out. So if we go to the right and we start to think about prompt tuning, optimizing rag data, right? Again, we're using the same prompt. So see, see how these things blur and contextual data integration, right? Making sure it's high quality, making sure it's actually hitting on what might be missing in the general model you're gonna see this for everybody, iterative testing and refinement. So as you go, I'm never saying, hey, set it up and put it into um, production, but you should be taking time to have power users prompt the heck out of it and getting feedback from them and starting to either adjust what the data looks like in the RAG architecture or refine the prompt tuning and make it more specific, right? Those are all things that you should be exhausting before you ever look at the bottom point, which is fine tuning, right? Because first, really make sure you need that. Like do not just fine tune. And then if you fine tune, you wanna be targeted. And oh, by the way, if you're fine tuning, you know, you're probably going to change the model you're using. There are so many things you should do before starting to fine tune. If something is very domain specific, you probably need to go back, listen to the first episode of this series and think through, am I selecting the right model? Because if I'm going to fine tune, I'm not using you know, GPT-40, I'm probably using Phi-3 or something that's a small, what I'll call a small large language model, something that is, you know, has less training, but 
you know, I'm able to train it myself and it's going to have more precision. So if you get to this point, you know, you should know it beforehand. But I will tell you, most of the use cases you're going to run into, you know, especially the way how fast this technology is moving, you probably won't need to do a whole lot of fine tuning. However, I think there will be really cool use cases um, with smaller language, smaller, large language models soon. Design and engineering. All right. This isn't, I don't think, and I would love to hear anybody in the chatter, but like, I've always said, why, why don't we build data products and data things like we do experiences? Because we should. Like, part of it is how do I give a good experience to a user? Like, not just how do I, you know, regurgitate the data that I have, but how do I build a good AI experience? Like, what does that look like? Who's going to be using it? How do I help? You can see in the user centric prompt design, how do I, how do I help somebody write a better prompt? So now you're getting into the point of how do we get to a place where it's not just free form chat bots, but it's actually, you know, I'm guiding you through the right way, whether it's a two way chat or it's maybe check some boxes, have some drop downs, and then ask a question. There's a lot of ways to use these pre-trained models and, you know, guide people to make better prompts. I actually think there's so much to do there. Um, and I hope people do that. Another thing like data-driven interactions, right? Like, I don't know if you've heard, um, one of the things that the CEO of NVIDIA has said is that in the near future, design will happen at a pixel level because you will be able to hyper-personalize so much using this. And designers need to start thinking about it that way along with their engineering partners. Because at the end of the day, the fact that you see, I might see a certain cover for a show on Netflix and somebody else might see a different cover, there's something to that. And that is really where we need to embed data and AI into even how we design things. And then make it easy, make it accessible. It's no good if I, you know, are, am having a hard time putting a prompt in or I'm having a hard time taking the data or content out. I know today nobody's quite solved that yet, but that, you know, if you're going to go build something, build it the right way, you know, take it the next level. And then let's talk about configuring and integrating services, right? You know, first of all, a lot of these AI services, it's not just, you know, plug into Azure Data Factory and start to, you know, just use GPT-4. There's all sorts of services, which I went over in the first episode. So make sure you're selecting the right one for the right use case. Make sure that you're configuring it, right? Like, so... All of that, there's a lot of need. And then just think about how is this going to, how are the data pipelines going to run? You know, are we integrating this into another application or product? What is that going to look like? And then how do we make sure that it's performing well? These are all things that, you know, seem to be an afterthought. And, you know, if we just think about, you know, it's no longer good enough to build you know, mobile apps and build dashboards only, but we have to build intelligent experiences, right? It's all about how do these things come together and pre-trained models do make it possible for a lot of organizations and folks to be able to build their own and to be very, very successful. You have to kind of look at the big picture. All right, process. So I love a good virtuous cycle, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and when I think about AI, right, it's, it's all about, you know, three stages, envision, evaluate, execute. And then from doing that, I believe you're able to maximize value, mitigate risks and, you know, kind of come out with, if I'm focused on delivering outcomes, I'm going to. If I'm focused on delivering outputs, I'm going to. Outputs don't always give outcomes, but if you focus on delivering outcomes and you're kind of using this three-step process, which I'm going to go deep into, right? But this is what I believe is the key to being successful.
So in vision, um, I'm not, I'm going to do my best not to milk these slides. Um, you guys will have this and we can talk about it in Q and A of course, but you know, maturity assessment very quickly, where are you at? Like, is, is your organization ready to use it? Is your data in a place to take advantage of it? Do you even know how it's going to improve the business? Without that, without even a start of it, and it doesn't need to take, I mean, I do these in one to two weeks. I don't need a long time to do them, but just knowing where you are is so important, right? And then secondly, what's your strategic roadmap, right? What are the use cases? How are they going to grow my maturity? How are they balanced in urgency, impact, feasibility, resources? Like, what, what does that look like? And then how do I... How do I maybe build my data foundation, build my data and AI literacy, and deliver use cases at the same time? So, you know, the final bullet there is like, what is that dual track um, roadmap that says we're going to deliver a customer service chatbot and we're going to build the foundation of customer data platform because we need that? to do it. And then we're also going to have to train customer service reps on how to prompt. You have to have that mentality once you kind of know where you're at and you know what's important. And then finally, what's the target architecture? We got to, And you can see it's more than just, hey, AI, it's cloud platform content. We have to think about content and data governance together because with these large models, whether it's unstructured or structured data, it's going to be important. Ingestion, visualization, science and analytics, automation. So all of these things, we need to understand what, what are we going for before we even start to do it. And again, it doesn't need to take three months. It doesn't need to, you know, there are different levels of fidelity. Like I said, two weeks I can do some version of this. And that's not, that is a very good investment, you know, based on just pointing the boat the right way and knowing where you're going and how you're going to try to get there. That is everything. Second, evaluate. Now, we're not putting anything into production. And I would say in this space, it is the year of the POC, um, which I'm kind of tired of, because when are we going to get stuff into production? But I do agree with the fact that, you know, I think a lot of people are actually skipping to doing POCs and not doing this, which, okay, great. We know what the technology could do, but I could have found that out by just using chat GPT, right? So, you know, both of these have to be done. One, let's productize things. Don't think of things as you know, a one-off app or a one-off feature, but what are we trying to solve for? In the customer service, you know, AI space, I think about so many different applications there. But if I focus on, hey, you know, as part of this customer service product portfolio, AI product portfolio, I'm going to, you know, one, have to vectorize a lot of different content. Two, I'm going to need a customer data platform. Three, I'm going to want a chatbot for customer service representatives to use and a chatbot for my customers to use. And how do I tie all of that together? So over time, the customer service chatbot that's in front of customers is answering a majority of the questions and less and less are having to be answered by customer service reps. How do you think about that holistically so that you can get the most out of? And then how do you think of all those different parts as composable pieces that could be used in different areas? So, okay, great. I got this customer service chat bot and it, it's running and it's, it's kind of one of those things that helps um, customers and customer service reps best find the information they need as soon as possible. Great. You know what that I could use that for? I could use that in the factory for operations when a machine goes down and I have to figure out how to fix it. There are so many applications that are composable. And if you think about it from a product standpoint and a composable feature standpoint, 
you're going to be in a lot better space. So make sure you do that. Again, this does not have to be a year of planning. This could be very quick. And then you go into the POC, right? And again, we're all data people here. At least we want to be, right? Um, I still think I'm trying to be one. But what is success criteria? Don't build a thing. Don't build a POC. Don't build anything until you know what that success criteria is, right? And just make sure that you're proving it out and that as you're proving it out, you're clearly figuring out what is the path to production for this. And that's really where I think, I think we all kind of get this execute phase, right? Um, pretty standard, um, but definitely different pieces from all three of those capabilities we talked about earlier. So, you know, making sure the data is ready, making sure the experience is right, training and deploying the model, integrating, monitor and evaluating, and improving and scaling. So, you know, if we know number one, What's the, where are we at and where do we want to go? And kind of how do we think we're going to get there? Two, great, let's start going this way and let's test it out and make adjustments if we need to. And then three, let's really go full sales all the way to where we want to go, right? And take it all the way and make sure that we're just getting better over time. Again, I don't think this is, I'm not solving world peace or, you know, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I think these are just best practices that when a new set of technologies comes out, we can kind of lose sight of what has worked like. And this is me taking a lot of um, my experiences from before AI, you know, had become a big thing. And I was just trying to get people dashboards that were helpful but how do we apply all of these learnings and kind of take advantage of it? All right, pitfalls. So let's talk about those. Over-engineering. So I've worked with data scientists when this, you know, these models first became available. They wanted to train them right away and treat them like a data science thing. There is going to be, you know, people that, want to clean the data so much and get it so perfect and do all this perfect stuff, watch it. You know, when we talk about features, layers, customizations, it's the data, it's the fine tuning, it's everything. Just take it easy. Don't over-engineer it. Don't try to overdo it. Keep it pretty like, hey, here's a pre-trained model. Here's my base. And I'm going to adopt it based on how it's actually working. The great thing about the pre-trained models is that they're kind of ready to do something right now. So don't over-engineer it. Take your time. Don't be reckless. You know, don't put things in front of customers that um, are not ready for prime time. But also, don't try to make version one perfect. Don't try to get everything perfect in POC see how it can help. At the end of the day, they're kind of black boxes, like honestly. So we don't even know how they're going to react to what we want them to do until we do it. So don't over-engineer. That's number one. A lot of wasted time and energy there. Uh, had to have a baby trying to be fed something here because, you know, also I don't want people treating data as an input. Again, if you've heard me talk before, you know, it's data should be treated like a corporate asset, a product, you know, it should be seen as a core part of this. It shouldn't be seen as an afterthought. So making sure it is curated, it is managed, it's presented in ways that actually add value to the user experience. Like I key, I always say this to folks, but like name me an application that doesn't, isn't driven by data, provides data, or collects data. They don't exist. They've always been there. And it's like, what do you think Google Maps is doing for you when you're trying to drive? So definitely make sure your organization is not just, okay, yeah, yeah, plug the data in, whatever. We got the nice UI and we're 
pointing GPT in it. If you do that, you know, trough of despair, as they say in the Gartner hype cycle. Finally, it wouldn't be a presentation if I didn't quote TLC, but don't get waterfally on it. Do not try to operate in silos with handoffs or linear. This is going to take teams rallying, rallying around what needs to be done, right? That's the only way that we're going to actually um, solve for this. So cross-functional teams, you know, shared goals and success metrics, that's how you get it done. It just doesn't work. Like you, you just, I can't, say enough, the pre-trained models are a black box. So if you create more linear black box handoffs, like, oh, business user tells me this, great. I'm a data person. I do the data thing. Great. I hand it off to the engineers and designers. They do their thing. You know, at the end of the game, it becomes a game of telephone. Don't, don't get caught in that. Hub and spoke, not linear. Don't chase those waterfalls. So Three takeaways from this and when you're trying to train a pre-trained model. One, using pre-trained models is a combination of current approaches. So there is not, and I know we've tried to, you know, there's been all sorts of positions flying around of, oh, is prompt engineering the next thing? Well, no, now, now we got ways to, you know, you know, for programmers to take back prompt tuning and stuff like that. Here's what I'll say. I don't know how it's going to fall out, but all I know is that I've not had success when I'm either, you know, working with just the business and maybe it's me as a, you know, very old timey data scientist trying to help them. Right. Um, or it could be, um, you know, a data scientist trying to do things in a, in a silo or it could be a cloud developer, full stack developer trying to do things. They, right now, that position doesn't exist to get the most out of these. So please, like, just know it's not a data science project. It's not an application project. And, you know, it is also not, hey, business, go buy whatever you want and start doing stuff. It needs to be a combination of all current approaches because right now, it's not clear what's going to stick. So make sure you're bringing people together. Two, prompting excellence by business users is critical to success. Again, if, if business users can't use the tool, what's the point? And also if business users don't understand how prompting works, how can they best inform data scientists and developers as to what to put in prompt tuning? or help them pick the model. And then three, garbage in, garbage out still applies. So not a silver bullet, the data has to be good. If you need to vectorize it, you need to vectorize it. If you're using tabular data, that's okay. Don't use a large language model. There's plenty of things to use tabular, tabular data. So understanding what the data is supposed to be and if it's good or not, that is really where this is going to take off. And, you know, from that, um, I'm going to take a look real quick at and get your questions in, Mark. I think we have we have one question, but a little more time for Q&A if we want, because that's my last slide. Well, I, I, I have a question for you, actually. Uh, yeah, I was chatting with somebody the other day and they were like, well, we always say garbage in, garbage out and data quality. And uh, maybe maybe for AI, it's good inputs, uh, good outputs um, kind of a statement. But as you were going through your presentation, I was thinking about the nature of uh, how inputs are different than um, the data that that businesses manage, like the data asset itself. Can can you describe the difference between inputs and 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 just the overall data asset? Yeah, so can you, a little clarifying on that, um, you know, so garbage in, garbage out, all right, what are the inputs, right? The prompt, mm -hmm. um, 
the RAD data that we might use. Um, and the RAG data starts to be kind of broken up into, you know, structured, semi-structured and unstructured, right? Because these pre-trained models kind of, they don't care as much about that it's all tabular, but some data is just better tabular. So, you know, when I say garbage in, garbage out, Mark, I'm kind of talking about the idea of, yes, data quality, but I would even go, you know, as a former data governance, you know, person, I've always thought that if I don't have a good definition of what data is supposed to be, and let's just apply data to content and things like that, if I don't, if I don't know what it's supposed to be, how do I know if it's good or not? So if we apply that same kind of golden rule of thumb of, if I don't know what I'm trying to exactly get from an AI model, how, how is it going to know what to give me? That's kind of my rule of thumb. And I'm not sure if I answered your question directly. Oh, totally. But, yeah. No, yeah, that, that's, that's perfect. Because that kind of gets, gets back into your success metrics um, for for a proof of concept as well. Like, how do you know you're achieving success with your AI uh, without a success, success metric uh, to yeah. go along with uh, it? It's got to be thumbs up, thumbs down. Some of the success metrics that, you know, I've seen established, of course, is like, one, is it the right answer? And two, can, did it do what I thought it was going to do? So, you know, don't be afraid, you know, whoever, whoever you are on this call, but don't be afraid to say, hey, if I'm going to do this chat bot, I need it to go and I need it to give me a citation of where it found that answer. That is a thing. That is a very important part. So creating those feedback loops, Mark, to just like kind of say, what is, is this right or is this wrong? And why is it right or wrong? Those are feedback loops that we have to work with users to figure out how do we do that. And I've seen it done a couple of different ways. Um, and I, I do think one, having those citations back, at least in the short term, so that people can trust it. And then two, having a mechanism as easy as thumbs up, thumbs down with maybe a pop-up modal for, hey, tell me why, you know, pretty important. Awesome. Uh, and segueing from that in chat, uh, somebody was asking, how do you layer or embed the business engine uh, consists of all governance rules, policy hierarchy rules in between the data and the AI layers? Uh, Raj, maybe you and I can figure that out one day. Uh, I think we're, <laughs> I think we're still trying to figure that out. Right. I do think, um, there are some interesting things happening, um, especially with the big cloud providers. And I just think about, um, what Microsoft is attempting to do with purview and how they have, um, kind of they have one lake and one drive and they have purview as something that you can apply all of your policies to. And then they have fabric, you know, that's supposed to help kind of guide all of the data science and AI you would use. So, you know, Raj, I, how do we do it? I don't know if you and I can figure that out. We can be very rich, rich folks. Um, but I think in general, the rule of thumb is that we have to treat documents and conversations, whether they're in email or chat, we have to treat those like we would treat data. And then we have to somehow, instead of having everything be separate, tie everything together. I, I think this is where the idea of domains can really be powerful is because if I take everything in a certain domain, you know, chat, email, documents, data, and I'm able to create policies around that. And I'm able to kind of, you know, run the marble through and make sure that it's going where I need. Like that's the ultimate solution. But it's, it's a great question and a great point because there is nothing today. And the closest I've seen somebody try to do it is just the idea of, 
fabric um, from Microsoft and, you know, just their application of purview. But then everybody on here kind of knows, well, they don't always hit the mark on some of this stuff. So I suspect, you know, it will be figured out. Um, but I think it's up to us to just kind of make sure that, you know, we're pushing for that. Just like, you know, when I was deep into data governance at Nike, I was very big on, hey, we have to, um, we have to govern KPIs that exist in PowerPoints that come from dashboards that come from wherever. We need to govern all of that. And we've always, we always should have been governing all of that. So I think this just exasperates that problem. And I don't know, Raj, and you can say in the chat or other people can say in the chat, oh, if you've run into that, it's like, okay, great. The data is good, but you're using it wrong. And it's on this PowerPoint. And how do I govern the PowerPoint? I think AI just starts to exasperate some of the problems we had anyway. Um, but yeah, like I would love to see how it's going to be solved. It's, it's one of the passion projects I have is figuring that out. It sounds, Nick, like our brains should be moving towards uh, policy enforcement middleware and that AI engines just become a, a consumer of that policy enforcement middleware. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, how do you how do you put the toothpaste back in the tube, right? Like, don't let it get out first kind of thing. Uh, um, we do have a question in Q&A. What are your views on the recent FTC guidelines on AI? And do you believe that this will impact the use of chatbots and other AI applications? Oh, boy. Um, you know, gosh, I don't know how everybody feels. Thank you for the question. I'm not exasperated by the question. I'm exasperated by when are we ever going to start to actually solve real problems, right? I just think about, you know, when when GPT first came out and kind of blew it all open, you know, people were just like, oh, we need to do something. And then what happens is Washington, you know, Washington brings in people who stand to benefit from the rules that they make, right? So I'm just going to say this. I, I think it's fine, whatever they did. Um, I think that there is there's just a missing piece here where, you know, again, you know, to Raj's point earlier, we have these things called policies and they're called laws. They're not necessarily broken, but are we actually applying them? You know, if we think about, you know, if we even want to try to think about uh, eight years ago or so, um, and just think about kind of the whole Facebook thing and what was going on and what goes on today with AI behind the scenes. Like, haven't we kind of lost um, a little bit of the script, you know, like, so I think those guidelines are fine, but I do think that in general, you know, we need to start revisiting, are we actually applying the laws, the laws are there. They're really there. Anti-monopoly, monopoly, like free speech without doing harm to people. These things are all right to privacy. These are all things that we have. But until our lawmakers, until the folks that are in a position to apply those and modernize them, until they're actually truly read in and not by people that stand to profit from it, I think we're going to struggle with it. So I don't know, maybe, uh, and I, I know, uh, oh, anonymous, like it was a good question. I just don't know how to answer it because I'm kind of, I think they're fine, but do they actually, you know, let's go back to what are the six success criteria? Like, are we actually going to have the impact that we think we're going to have? And I tend to be, a little bit more of a pessimist and say, yeah, but aren't we just not applying the laws that we have and, you know, being able to apply them to a modern use case versus, you know, trying to reinvent them. I just think it's kind of a fool's errand sometimes. I love that insight, Nick. And, and, um, it, it makes me think about like just the different regulations that are coming up all over the world. 
it's almost like politicians are having a knee jerk reaction to how quickly um, uh, large language models and, and, and chat bots really kind of took over our cultural zeitgeist and kind of left yeah. politicians by the wayside. <laughs> exactly. And I saw like Mark, I see, you know, especially earlier in the chat, um, you know, all this stuff about herding cats, right? And I see a few people talking through that, which is great. Go to the first episode of this. The first episode of this series is literally called, you know, AI for executives. And and why I did it was it was so that, you know, hopefully some business leaders would join and learn something. But what I tried to do, Darcy and Chris, is actually try to give you guys the content to go have that discussion with your business leaders and just say, hey, did you know 90% of AI things don't even make it to production and you're going to waste a lot of money? There's a lot of good stuff in there. Not trying to self-promote because it's already done, so it doesn't matter to me. But it is there for you guys if you want to go grab that content. Uh, yeah, and here's can... another good... Yeah, another yeah. good question there too. It is a great question. Um, isn't internal bureaucracy and red tape intracompany more of a risk than federal regulation? What are some paths through that? Yeah, um, so that's there's two sides of it, right? I am terrified to use AI and I will not use it, hence red tape. And then let's just use it for whatever. I don't care. <laughs> Right. So those are two sides of it. Um, again, I try in the and I don't know. I, I, I don't want to keep pointing back to the first episode, but in general, both of those are losing propositions. Right. It's how do I use AI to improve my organization? And if I think about improving my organization, you know, how do I improve my employee experience, my customer experience, and kind of the profits and things that um, shareholders care about? There are ways through that red tape. I actually got a very similar, um, a similar question at a different event I did. Um, and it kind of comes down to, well, there's a couple ways. And as like a... Um, as a consultant now for quite a quite a while, there's a couple of strategies. The first is, can I logically explain to these leaders why what they're thinking is wrong? Okay, all this red tape, here's why you're wrong. Like, and, and I've had these discussions like, hey, legal, did you know that AI has been embedded in our email for years? What do you think spell check is? What do you think autocomplete email is? Like, so it's there and it's not going away. And by the way, everybody's using chat GPT, even if you don't allow it. So there are a couple ways through red tape. You know, one is, hey, can I logically do it? Two is, can I tell you what I think is going to happen? And then when it does happen, can I say, hey, remember that? And I suggested that. And then and I'm not trying to be funny, but it kind of is the, because I've been, I've only been a consultant for a little bit of time. And before that I was at corporations, but bring in a consultant to tell them the same dang thing that you've been telling them the whole time. Um, it's, it's like a last resort, but sometimes, you know, somebody like me can, you know, come in and say the same thing you've said and they listen. Um, and then I see Mark took care of that question. Uh, and there's the link to to the first one, which was really about demystifying. That's kind of how I had this set up, right? Like, how do I explain to executives, right, and business leaders? And then how do I talk about, um, you know, what does training look like for this stuff? Because people are kind of missing on that, too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nick. And that's all the time we have for today. 
Uh, so we'll be posting this up within a couple of business days and, uh, and you'll be able to see the recording if you were unable to make the presentation live or just see it again if, uh, if you had a great time. And I know we all did. And, and thank you, everybody, for your wonderful interaction and chat. And thank you so much, Nick, for your, your insight and wisdom and expertise. Have a wonderful Thanks. rest of the day, everybody. Thanks for your help, Mark. Thanks, everybody.